Welcome to our program on Kardec Radio. Hello, dear friends, and welcome to Miracles According to Spiritism. My name is Sunshine Beck, and we're meeting here every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to talk about the miracles, miracles, how spiritism sees them. And we're taught, we're leaning our study on Genesis, the book Genesis by Alan Kardec, the second part, which is entitled Characteristics of Miracles. It's chapter 13. And last week we talked about the miracles in the theological sense, and we will recap in a minute. And today we will be talking about the spiritism. Spiritism does not perform miracles. Wow. So dear friends, let us share the screen because today we're going to add a little um, PowerPoint just to highlight the points, to make it hopefully more clean and clear. So let us see whether this works and we're checking real quick the um, see that this works also I'm hoping you guys are seeing the PowerPoint it appears to be that way which is wonderful so we're going to go right here so this is Last week, we talked about um, the miracles in the theological sense. And what we talked about is that miracles are really defined as a derogation from the laws of nature. Now, let us remember that the laws of nature are God's laws. So gods of nature are God's laws. The characteristics of miracles we found out last week is that they're supernatural, they're unusual, they're isolated, and exceptional events. The minute they're being repeated, either deliberately or not deliberately, they're not called miracles any, more, any longer. In other words, anything whose cause was unknown was seen and characterized as a miracle, as the supernatural. Now, spiritism brings the supernatural back into the natural law. It builds a bridge. And we can already hunch that most likely that takes the miracle out of the miraculous out of the miracle. So how does spiritism do that? By explaining that matter, namely the material principle, which is inert by itself, must be joined by the spiritual principle namely the spirit, to animalize the material principle through the vital principle. And it's, the vital principle is also called the animalized electric energy or magnetic fluid. It's essentially the link between spirit and matter. So both principles, the spiritual principle as well as the material principle, are, of course, part of of God's laws, of natural law. So both belong to it. So this is in essence what we discussed last week. Now today, as I said, we are going to the new chapter and you will find it on page 269 in Genesis. Spiritism does not perform miracles. We're not going to read everything, but, but mostly um, we're reading it. So just the invitation stands for you to go to Genesis and um, fill out the gaps, so to speak. And I welcome you all, dear friends. At this point, I'm looking at a screen that just displays my um, PowerPoint, our PowerPoint. So I will say hello to you all today. Just feel hugged and welcomed. Thank you so much for joining. Spiritism has come to do in its own turn what each science has done when it first appeared. What was that? What did each science do? First of all, 
what are the, what do they mean by each science? Here are a few examples. Biology is a science, chemistry is a sign, astronom astrono astronomy is a science, physics is a science, and many, many more. So each time a science appeared, it came out with new definitions, with new laws. So each time a new law, a new science came out, it revealed new laws. And consequently, it explained the phenomena that are within the jurisdiction of such laws. So each science did that. And we're familiar with that. We've studied science, maybe professionally, maybe in school. Of course, these phenomena are attached to the existence of spirits and the intervention in the, in the material world as far as spiritism is concerned. It is said that that is precisely what is supernatural about them. This was the old view. So spiritism reveals new laws that explain phenomena that are falling under such laws, just like the material sciences did. What are some of these phenomena, for example? The fact that spirits exist, the fact that spirits intervene in the material world, all of this, when it's defined and laws are built around it, is not a supernatural event anymore. A spirit is nothing but a soul that has survived the body. We know that. Alan Kardec defined a spirit a spirit without a physical body would be called spirit. A spirit called with a physical body is called soul. So spirit is a soul that has survived the body. Since the spirit does not die, it is the principal being, whereas the body is only an accessory that is destroyed. We know that the body falls off, Whereas our spirit is immortal. It continues on. It doesn't die. The soul's existence is as natural after incarnation as it is during. It is subject to the laws that govern the spiritual principle. So the spirit is a soul that has survived the body and the spirit is the principal being versus the body, which is transitory. It falls off. So now spiritism, spirits now become subject to laws. And these laws govern the spiritual principle. So we're reading the sentence again. Thus the soul's existence is as natural after incarnation as it is during. The soul is subject to the laws that govern the spiritual principle, just as the body is subject to those that govern the material principle. It's very simple, it makes sense. Spirit subject to laws that govern the spiritual principle. The body is subject to the laws that govern the material principle. And these laws we already know. Alan Kardec didn't have to concern himself with those because those are the physical laws, science. But now spiritism came out with their own laws regarding the spiritual principle. So when we go to the front of this book, on page 26, and this is in chapter one, and it's entitled, Char The Character of the Spiritist Revelation. We're going to understand this principle a little bit further, just because it's very important that we're building the foundation here to understand later on all the examples that Jesus brought to us. So here, Alan Kardec tells us, in the same way that science per se has at its object, the study of the laws of the material principle, the special object of spiritism is the knowledge of the laws of the spiritual principle. Very simple, right? 
Now, since the latter, namely the spiritual principle, is one of the forces of nature, falls under the law of nature, which reacts incessantly and reciprocally upon the material principle, it follows that knowledge of one cannot be complete without knowledge of the other. So Ellen Carter essentially says that the spiritual principle consistently acts on the material principle. And consequently, it, it, one cannot live without the other. And we need to know the spiritual principle as well as we need to know the material principle because they're working together. But so far, before spiritism came, that wasn't the case. And consequently, a lot of things became woo-woo and nobody was able to explain them because there weren't any laws. And then they, were, they fell into the category of miracles. Spiritism and science complete each other. Science without spiritism is completely unable to explain certain phenomena, solely by means of the laws of matter. And spiritism without science would lack support and control. It's a beautiful marriage, dear friends. And spiritism came at the exact right time. Science had to have been developed far enough for spiritism to come in and lean on the principle of the scientific principles and laws. But both need to work together. And one day, hopefully, I know not hopefully it will happen on planet Earth, we will have this beautiful symbiosis widespread. So let us continue on um, page 269 of our chapter, Spiritism Does Not Perform Miracles. However, since these two principles, namely the material and the spiritual principle, have necessary affinity, since they incessantly react on each other, and since their simultaneous action results in the movement and harmony of the whole, it follows that spirituality and materiality are two parts of the same whole. So Alan Kardec with his incredible logic shows that us that the spiritual principle and the material principle as they work on together are parts of a whole, of one piece, basically the two sides of a coin. Both principles react on each other. Spirituality and materiality are parts of the same whole. And of course, if one is part is subject to laws, the other one has to be too. And that is where spiritism came in to establish the laws for the spiritual principle. And the laws that govern the interaction of the spiritual principle and the material principle, because spirit enlivens matter. This body would be inert without my spirit making it talk and move, making it intelligent, so to speak, or semi-intelligent in my sense. But I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Now, this interaction is governed by laws as well and those are the moral laws and we find them in the third part of the spirits book and this particular definition that we're just mentioning is on page is is question 617 in the spirits book if you want to refer to it all right so now we are going to item five during its incarnation if you friends if you have any questions or comments, please post them. And when we go back to the main page, we'll, we'll look at them. And maybe, actually, I can look here on my phone. Hello, Nora. <laughs> Hi, dear friend. Thank you so much for joining. Flavio, Rilo Suni, Rila Suni, so nice to have you here. Victoria Baker and uh, Fizan Khan is watching. So good, dear friends, Flavia, dear friend, Teresa Castro, Abby Shear from New Freedom, Pennsylvania. All right, Carmen Santiago, Tony, dear friend, Carolyn Correa, Anna Paula Di Mateos. Thank you so much, friends. And feel free to add to it or ask questions. We want to make it interactive. So let us continue. Now we're going to item five. 
During its incarnation, the spirit acts on matter by means of its fluidic body or perispirit. We know that we are a soul and the connection, the intermediary between our very subtle soul and our very dense body is the perispirit. And the unity of the soul and the perispirit travels from lifetime to lifetime. The body is always transitory and keeps changing. The same happens outside of incarnation. So during its incarnation, the spirit acts on matter by means of its fluidic body or perispirit. And the same happens outside of incarnation. So the soul via the perispirit still acts on matter. It's more subtle matter, but we will be seeing in a minute how it also actually acts on matter and how the mechanism works. As a spirit and according to its capabilities, it does what it used to do as a man or woman once discarnated. However, since it no longer has the corporeal body as its instrument, the spirit uses when necessary the phys physical organs of an incarnate, who then becomes what is called a medium. We're aware of that, right? So once a spirit is discarnate and it wants to act something out in the physical realm, it seeks out a medium. It uses the physical form, it uses the medium to get across a message. That message might be verbal, it might be, um, it might be by moving tables. It, might, it has very different characteristics. It is like someone who cannot write by himself and thus employs the hand of a secretary or someone who does not know a particular language and thus makes use of an interpreter. That's what the spirit does. A secretary and an interpreter are mediums for an incarnate. A secretary and an interpreter are mediums for an incarnate, just as the medium is the secretary or interpreter for a spirit. So in summary, in this item five, Alan Kardec is, is reminding us that during our incarnation, our spirit acts on matter via the perispirit, through the, by means of the perispirit, which is our fluidic body. It is less dense, it's more dense than our soul, but it's less, it, it is more dense than our soul, but less dense than our body. So it's the perfect bridge. The same happens after discarnation, because guess what? We're still spirit and perispirit. And the spirit at times uses physical organs of incarnates and those incarnates are labeled mediums. And Alan Kardec defines mediums or gives us this beautiful analogy that mediums, a medium is a secretary or interpreter for the spirit because the spirit doesn't have a physical form anymore, right? All right, so we're moving on to item six. Since the environment in which spirits act and their means of doing so are not the same as in the state of incarnation, the effects are different. So spirits act in a different environment than incarnates, right? Because the environment that spirits find themselves in is much less dense than our life here on earth, for example. So consequently, the effects are different. Such effects seem supernatural only because they're produced with the help of agents that are not the same as the ones that serve us. So these effects that are different for discarnates appear only supernatural to us incarnates because they're produced with the help of agents that we on the whole are ignorant about we don't know about them we don't know what they are and when we don't know something and we can't explain it boom it becomes a miracle 
and more so in former times because we knew less as, as mankind, less so today and in particular since spiritism came along. So these agents are found in nature, their manifestations, the manifestations are subject to laws. They're not supernatural. Even though these agents might be unknown to us, they're known to some because these agents are found in nature. What are these agents? For example, the universal cosmic fluid, the vital principle, ectoplasm, just some examples. So hopefully we understand how it works together. So we're going back to the text and then we're going to go over it again because this is really vital. So um, such effects as a discarnate, such effects seem supernatural only because they're produced with the help of agents that are not the same as the ones that serve us. However, since these agents are to be found in nature, and since the manifestations occur due to certain laws, there is nothing supernatural or extraordinary about them, right? Makes sense. Before the properties of electricity were, were known, Electrical phenomena passed as wonders in the eyes of certain people. But after their cause became known, the extraordinary disappeared. The same applies to spirit phenomena, which are no more outside natural laws than are the electric, acoustical, luminous, and other types of phenomena that have served as a source for a multitude of superstitious beliefs. So, number six, we're summarizing again, item six. Spirits act in different environment than incarnated spirits. Consequently, since they find themselves in a different environment, the effects are different. These effects appear only supernatural because they were produced with the help of agents that are on the whole unknown to us. These agents, however, are found in nature and the manifestations are subject to laws. The laws that spiritism came to create, to explain, to explain. Consequently, it's not a miracle anymore. Examples for these agents are universal cosmic fluid of course we have have it too here we are we are made out of it we're, we're certain forms of it but alan kardec still uses that as an example the vital principle ectoplasm all of this is for the regular eye for the regular person doesn't exist is not explainable these agents don't exist because we can't see them or touch them, so to speak. Let us move on to item seven. Not yet. We're going to move back. If we know how to. Okay. And I'm going to actually stop sharing for a moment so you guys can see me and I can hopefully see you. I'm also going to change it to the comments to see whether there's any questions not yet okay seven nonetheless it will be said you believe that a spirit can raise a table and hold it up in the air without any point of support is that not a derogation from the law of gravity we may think so right how can it be that a spirit is actually raising a table is that not a derogation of gravity gravity pulls everything down okay right? Yes, the answer is from the law that is known. But do we know every law? Certainly we don't. But we're learning more. And thanks to Alan Kardec and the spirits on high, we've come a long way. Before experiments were performed entailing the lifting power of certain gases, who would have said that a heavy apparatus carrying several people could overcome the power of gravity? a plane, right? A heavy duty thing that none of us can lift, loaded up for so many bodies and luggage and other things. And, and that can actually defy gravity. 
at some point, if somebody had told that people before us, they would have said, crazy, that must be a miracle, right? Because it couldn't be explained. In the eyes of the common folk, would that not have seemed extraordinary, diabolical even, a century ago? If anyone had proposed transmitting a message 500 leaks and receiving a response within a few minutes, that person would have been regarded as insane. And if it had been done, people would have believed that the devil was at the person's command. Because back then, only the devil was capable of traveling so quickly. Wow. Based on that, we're living in a very devilish time because what we're doing is at the push of a button, we're sending messages out worldwide within split seconds, right? So, but we can explain why. So it's not a miracle, it can be explained. Nowadays, however, not only is such a thing acknowledged as being possible, but it seems most natural. And that was 150, 160 years ago during Alan Kardec's times. And now things have changed so much during the last 150, 60 years. Why then could not an unknown fluid in certain circumstances have the property of counterbalancing the effect of gravity? Good question. Just as hydrogen counterbalances the weight of a balloon, actually, that is exactly what happens in the case of the table. So what was the question? The question was, why then could not an unknown fluid in certain circumstances have the property of counterbalancing the effects of gravity? Actually, that is exactly what happens in the case of the table. So now, let us explain how this works. And we're going to share it again. Okay, thank you for your patience, dear friends. All right, so we're going to go to the next one. So how does a spirit move a solid object? For this, we're actually going over to the medium's book. And the medium's book is we're going to chapter four. The chapter is entitled Explanation of the Physical Manifestations. Why physical manifestation? Well, moving a solid object, like for example, a table, is a physical manifestation. It's actually a physical object that's being moved. Consequently, it is characterized as a physical manis manifestation. Movements and Suspensions is the subtitle. Having used both reasoning and phenomena to demonstrate the existence of spirits, along with the possibility of their being able to act upon matter, spirits acting upon matter, we must now determine how the spirits' actions are produced and how they operate in order to move tables and other inert objects. Doesn't matter whether it's a table or not, right? Any inert sub object. We know that the spiritual principle is acting on the material principle. There's a continuous, like for example here, the spiritual principle, the spirit is acting on our bodies, the material principle. We're actually experiencing that nonstop during our lives and in our brothers and sisters who are observing it as well. But now, the miraculous was how could this table levitate so let's continue so exciting isn't it we're learning so much so now um just making sure we're not overlooking anything I don't need okay so how does a spirit move a solid object we're going to skip over the short answer because we're going to go to the long one and then revisit the short answer. Do spirits lift tables using their arms, which have become solidified somehow? That was the main question that Alan Kardec and his team had at the time, apparently. Are they somehow using their perispiritual arms to move the table? 
And here's the answer. When a table moves underneath your hands, it is because the spirit, and they're talking, the spirits are talking to us incarnates. So it's our hands, the hands of the incarnates. So the spirit is saying, when a table moves underneath your hands, it is because the spirit, the spirit who has been evoked has taken enough of the universal cosmic fluid to infuse the table with artificial life. Aha, step number one. The spirit is, is infusing the table with universal fluid. Having prepared the table in this way, the spirit now attracts it and moves it under the influence of its own fluid, which it emits by exerting its own will. So it's cooperation between the universal fluid and the spirit's own fluid, which is under the command of the spirit's will. When the object that it wants to move is too heavy for the spirit, it asks for the help of other spirits who possess similar characteristics. Because of its ethereal nature, the spirit in and of itself cannot act upon dense matter with some kind of without some kind of intermediary. That is without the link that connects it to matter. Aha. This link is what you call the peri spirit and it provides the key to all physical spirit phenomena. All right, so let us back up. So the first step is the spirit decides it wants to move this table. So now it infuses the table with the universal fluid. Then it activates its own fluid, which is under the control, under the command of its will. Then the spirit attracts the spirit and moves it under the influence of its own fluid. If it can't do it alone, it calls in friends, hey, help me. And they're doing the same thing. They will infuse the table furthermore with universal fluid and adding their own fluid under the command of their own will in order to move the table. However, there's a third ingredient and that's the intermediary and that is the peri spirit. Without the peri spirit, nothing can happen. The spirit on its own wouldn't be able to move the table. Now, Ellen Kardec was wondering, are all spirits able to produce phenomena of this kind? Are they all capable of this? And the answer is the spirits who produce these phenomena are always of a less evolved nature that is not yet entirely free of material influences. So these kind of phenomena do not belong into the realm of the highly evolved spirits. They don't need to resort to the, these matters. But since we're trying to understand how the mechanism works of the spiritual element, exerting its will on the material element, while the spirit is discarnated, we need to go to this level to understand what laws are behind it. And that will help us explain the so-called miracles, the so-called supernatural. Alan Kardec adds, we have already stated that the density of the peri spirit, if one may say so, varies according to the nature of the various worlds. So we know that the, the peri spirit is different from world to world. The less evolved the world is, the more dense the peri spirits are and vice versa. It also seems to vary on the same world according to different individuals. In morally advanced spirits, it is subtle and comes close to the peri spirit of high order entities. This density of the peri spirit which leads it to greater affinity to matter is what enables low order spirits to be more skillful at physical manifestations. So 
these physical manifestations, this mechanism that we just explained, falls more into the domain of lower evolved, less evolved spirits. Why? Because their perispirit is denser than the highly evolved spirit's perispirit. All spirits, including us, the more, the less evolved we are, the denser our perispirit will be. And if the, per, the, the perispirit of a spirit is denser, more material, it is more prone to be able to create these manifestations, namely to move a table, to make grabs, to create noises, and, and to have pens move, this blanchette movement that happened at Alan Kardec's time, where actually a pen moved on its own without the hand of the medium touching it all those material phenomena is material effect effects mediumships mediumship effects so let us go continue if we now this Alan Kardec's wondering if we correctly understand what you have said speaking to a spirit the vital principle lies in the universal fluid so the vital principle which animates plants animals and humans is derived from the universal cosmic fluid. Rocks, water, air doesn't have a vital principle. It's not animated in that sense, like plants, animals, and humans are. And in the Spirits book, you find a whole little chapter on the vital principle to study. So if we correctly understand what you have said, the vital principle lies in the universal fluid. The spirit draws the semi-material envelope that comprises its perispirit from this fluid, from the universal cosmic fluid. So the perispirit is also drawn from the universal cosmic fluid. And it is through this fluid that it acts upon inert matter. Is this so? And the answer is the spirit animates matter with a sort of artificial life. Matter becomes infused with animal life. So in other words, for example, this body, if it wasn't infused with the vital principle, it wouldn't be moving. Once the spirit leaves, the body is inert. Same with the table. So the spirit itself does not push the table as if, as, if, as if it were some kind of physical load. And when the table rises into the air, the spirit is not lifting it with its arms either. Instead, the animated table obeys the impulse given to it by the spirit. And that is via the will. We know from Emmanuel and Thought in Life that the will is the guiding force of all beings, of, of, of us incarnates and discarnates. The will is the CEO of our mind. So nothing happens without the will. So there were those three steps, remember? The spirit is creating this, this drawing, this universal cosmic fluid, infusing the table with it. It adds its own, the spirit adds its own fluid, which is now under the command of the will, infusing the table as well, in order to make certain moves. And that goes via the perispirit, the semi-material envelope that the spirit, the spirit is enveloped with, both discarnate as well as incarnate. So what role does the medium now play in this phenomenon? And that's when the spirit says, I have already said that the medium's own fluid is combined with the universal fluid accumulated by the spirit. So now we have a fourth ingredient, and that is that the medium is now adding its, his, his or her own fluid to it, to this phenomena of moving the table. So the medium's own fluid is combined with the universal fluid accumulated by the spirit. Remember, the spirit is accumulating universal cosmic fluid and his own fluid. And now we're adding the medium's fluid to it. 
The uniting of both the animalized and universal fluids, which is the animalized is the fluid from the incarnate and the universal fluid is from the spirit, is required in order to endow the table with life. So in order for this table to actually move, it requires an incarnate, a medium, and the medium's fluid to infuse this table alongside the spirit infusing the table via the cos universal cosmic fluid and his or her own fluid. However, you must not forget that this life is only momentary. Of course, this table won't be enlivened forever, sometimes only just for minutes, right? Now, lastly, can a spirit act without a medium? Can a spirit act without resorting to a medium? Alan Carter is now wondering. Great question. The answer is, it can act without the medium being aware of it. In other words, many persons help spirits to produce certain phenomena without even suspecting it. Alan Kardec said in the medium's book early on that we're all mediums. Some of us are cognitive of it. We know about it. It's deliberate. And most of us are under the influence of spirits and we have no idea. So sometimes when we have certain phenomena happening in our house, like things are jumping off cu cupboards or mirrors fall and splatter, and there's obviously no wind and nobody touched it. Those are moments when we may act as an unconscious medium, supporting, adding our, loaning our fluid to the spirit's fluid and desire to have, for example, the mirror fall off the wall. So we need to be careful of, of that. We do need to become conscious. And of course, the more we link ourselves up to God and living a very Christ-like existence, Christ-centered life, the less we will be attracting lower order spirits who would indulge in activities like that. They're more mischievous spirits in that sense. So these persons, so these, so, okay. So can a spirit act without resorting to a medium? It can, but the medium, in, in other words, many persons help spirits to produce certain phenomena without even suspecting it. These persons are like fountains from which spirits draw the animal fluid they need. Consequently, the conscious participation of a medium, as you know, is not always necessary, especially with spontaneous phenomena. So we explained that, right? So what is the preponderance? This is our last question that Alan Kardec is asking. What is the preponderant cause in the production of this phenomena? The spirit itself or the fluid? When the table moves. What is the preponderant cause in the production of the table moving? Let's say this phenomena, the spirit itself or the fluid? The answer is, you may have guessed it, the spirit is the cause and the fluid is its instrument. Both are required. So why would that be? Why would the spirit be the cause? Because the spirit has the will, the mind, the desire to do it. And the spirit because it has this will to move this table from here to there, is now becoming active. The will is telling it, okay, I'm getting this universal cosmic fluid and infuse this table with it. Now I'm adding my own fluid with the intention to move it. Now I'm getting the fluid. Now a medium is adding his or her fluid to infuse the table further. And boom, here's the table moving. So that's why spirit is the cause the fluid is just the instrument how does a spirit move a solid object now let us see the answer the spirit combines a portion of the universal fluid which is the agent with the fluid emitted by the medium which is also an agent in order to move it so it's the cooperation 
between a discarnate spirit and an incarnate spirit who we call a medium and both are donating their fluids and the root of the fluid is the universal cosmic fluid and infusing the table to create this phenomena and those fluids are the agents they're the instruments so that completes our study for today i'm going to stop um sharing here so i can see you guys hi okay let's see there's a question does that hold true of sense or smells i've smelled my grandpa's cigar or my grandma's yes or my grandma's perfume it's beautiful yes and also with noises yes with all these phenomena Yes, Alan Carter actually talks about them in the Medium's book. For further study, it's very it would be very interesting to pick it up. And just in reading the chapter on the material, um, how is it entitled? Let me just quickly go back here. Explanation of the physical manifestations. There's different examples, and um, Alan Carter goes into depth. So we're starting to, um, as a matter of fact, let us summarize. Um, let us summarize today's gathering, and let us see. So, I think we, yeah. So here's the summary for today. Let us summarize because there's so much information. It's good to get a final um, breakdown. So what we learned today is that spiritism reveals new laws, which explain new phenomena, and these phenomena are falling under such laws. So before spiritism came along, certain phenomena, like this table movement was a phenomena, couldn't be explained. So it became a miracle. It fell into the box miracle, not to be explained. But now spiritism came along and brought new laws explaining these phenomena. And these phenomena are, for example, that spirits exist and that spirits act on the material world. The spiritual principle acts on the material principle constantly spiritual and material principle is subject to laws as we've just seen we've seen how the mechanism works the spirit acts on matter even after discarnation and that happens by a mediums as we've just seen so it's a natural phenomena it's not a miracle it happens all the time alan kardec was wondering how are we often under the influence of spirits? He essentially asked. And the answer is from the spirits on high, more so you can even than as you can even imagine. So we're constantly under the influence, influenced and subject to spirit influences continuously. The law of affinity primarily defines what kind of spirits because we know not all spirits are high level spirits on the other side because as you discarnate we're just we're still the same spirit so all the people who discarnate around us they are still they still have ways have ways to go right so it's up to us to see who we attract law of affinity law of attraction so the spirit how does the mechanism now work how does the spirit act on matter the spirit combines a portion of the universal cosmic fluid with the fluid emitted by the medium in order to move the object via its will, based on its will, on the spirit's will. The spirit can only momentarily animate objects or create perfumes or um, noises whatever the manifestation may be. And we also learned that this usually falls into the domain, these phenomena fall into the domain of lower level, less evolved spirits. Why? Because their perispirit is more dense, so they have they can do this better. And high level spirits, of course, they could do it too, but would they concern themselves with that, right? Probably not, unless there's some specific reason for it. And we also learned that we as spirits are not always conscious of the fact that we're loaning our, our fluids, our fluid, and aiding these phenomena. So that is something for us to observe and examine and see what kind of spirits we're attracting. 
right. Let me get out of here and want to see whether you guys have more questions. Whoops. I think we, there we go. All right, Tony, have you had a personal experience of objects moving or falling? Tony, yes, yeah, not too often, thank God, but I have had glasses drop in the middle of the night and it wakes me up and, and I don't think there was any movement around, but you know, it's like, boom, just falling off the shelf. Not too often, but I've had it, yes. It's always scary because we wonder what happened and we're trying to, we have a tendency to find a, a reason in our incarnated world, like wind or maybe uh, an earthquake or someone, right, moving by and doing it, but yes, yes. I've also had one of my garden plantings in the spring completely die overnight. No reason for it. I can't explain it. The neighbor's garden is thriving and mine dead. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, dear friends. So let us close with a little prayer. Let us, we've been so in our heads. Let us drop into our hearts. Yeah, and also let us get some music that will help us connect with our hearts to feel a little bit more balanced. These teachings are amazing and they will help us so much to understand stuff that we haven't understood so far. Let's see whether we will find. Hmm. Oh, excuse me, friends. I'm trying to. Maybe we can get this one here. I invite you to close your eyes. And let us connect first with our feet to draw our energy from our heads, feeling our feet firmly on the ground, saying hello to Mother Earth. And now let us feel the heartbeat in our chests, saying hello to our beautiful heart. And now let us move up to our mind that has just been engaged for a whole hour. And we're turning the mirror of our hearts and minds and directing it towards God. Immense love and light and guidance, God's mercy, God's justice, God's wisdom. We're saying hello, dear God. And we're saying hello, dear Jesus, our guide and model. And hello, Ellen Kardec. We thank you so much for your amazingly diligent work helping us understand the universe in new ways. Understanding why we're here, where we came from, and where we're going. Understanding what are miracles and what are not understanding the mechanisms how we act as spirits on matter we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this immortal lesson that we have received from you today we're grateful that we have this beautiful platform of the internet and cardiac radio on youtube where we congregate, where we exchange ideas, where we're creating harmony among each other. And as we move into this new week with gratitude to all the knowledge and the love and guidance we are continuously receiving, we're now asking for permission to close our gathering. And so be it. Thank you, dear friends, for joining. Thank you. And so God willing, we will meet you again next week. And we will, let us see what the title of the next, we're going to stay in the same chapter. 
And we will continue with item eight, eight through probably 12 to finish, or maybe to the end of the chapter. We're gonna finish the chapter next week. All right, friends, many blessings, lots of gratitude. Goodbye.